Hi right, folks and welcome to our video on the nasal cavity, the pharynx and the larynx. Uh, we're basically going to go superior to inferior, so we're going to start with the nasal cavity, go through the pharynx and then finish at the larynx and talk a little bit about the surrounding structures. All right, so let's talk about the nasal cavity. Um, in terms of needing to know things, I think the most important things for you guys to understand are, well, what it's meant to do um, and the important anatomical connections for it. Um, so the functions, what it actually does. So first of all, remember that obviously this is the main entrance for the respiratory tract. This is the way you're intended to breathe, um, although you can't obviously breathe through your mouth. Um, and so it does certain things to make the air better for your lungs. Um, so it moisturizes the air and it warms it up. Um, both just as, as functions of really being part of your body. Um, and it also has um, that sort of same epithelium mucus producing um, that creates that uh, sort of trap for pathogens and particles. So it stops them getting into your lungs, which will obviously cause infection and damage. Um, the sort of apex of the nasal cavity, so the top area, um, has a lot of the cells required to actually produce olfaction, so your sense of smell, um, which is why your um, your olfactory nerve comes down through the cribriform plate there. You can see at the very top. So that sort of clustered area, that's where you're actually going to get your sense of smell from. So it's not actually from the rest of the um, the nasal cavity. Um, and then also a lot of these openings here, we are, we will, which we'll talk about in just a sec, these provide drainage for different structures um, that basically have fluid and mucus that needs to come out. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, so we have these three um, sort of sets of structures that are all quite similar. Um, and so the uh, each of them, they have a bony prominence, which forms the actual structure for it, um, which is called a turbinate. Um, so you have superior, middle and inferior. Um, and then you have a, a fleshy contra over it. So that's the actual um, tissue. Um, and that's what you can actually see there. So they show you a uh, a diagram and point to something, it's probably the contra that they mean. Um, and then underneath the contra, sort of the contra is almost like a, a um in sort of like cover overhanging the actual opening, and then the opening underneath um is called the meatus. And so the nasal cavity is here, the contra hangs over the opening to the meatus, and then stuff can usually drain out of the meatus into the nasal cavity um, without stuff then you know debris going back up. Um yeah, and so the uh, middle meatus is used for drainage, drainage of most of your um, anterior sinuses, so your frontal sinus, um, your maxillary sinuses, and part of your ethmoid sinus, which is in the actual ethmoid bone itself. Um, they're all going to um, drain through the um, what we call the semilunar um, hiatus, and that's in the middle um, uh, meatus, um, and then past the, the middle nasal contra. The posterior sinuses, so that's your um, your uh, posterior ethmoid and then your sphenoid sinuses. Um, they have that little bit, they have a little bit called the um, sphenoethmoidal recess. So you can see here we have what we call the, sometimes called the sphenoid bulla um, or the sphenoid sinus, um, the middle medial part of it anyway. Um, and then the posterior ethmoid um, uh, drains partially through there, a um, bit through, there's a bit of, of movement through the ethmoid bulla as well, although that's sort of um, up in the air. Main things you need to understand are the semilunar hiatus, which comes down um, through the, the sort of middle meatal area, and then the sphenoethmoidal recess, um, which we sometimes use for sampling for certain procedures. And then you got your silica turkica there for your uh, pituitary. Um, yep. And then your lacrimal gland, gland, so they come from your orbits of your eyes um, down, and they actually drain through the inferior um, meata. So the nasal cavity actually connects to your orbits. And if you look at the back here, technically it's not, you know, it's debatable whether it's part of the nasal cavity itself or part of the um, the nasopharynx, which is a sort of rear area. Um, but that's the opening to the eustachian tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. Um, and so that's going to um, help equalize the pressure um, and provide any necessary drainage between your ear um, and your well, pharynx, basically. Okay. Um, so the pharynx is really the area posterior to it. So that's why I said it, technically um, the eustachian tube opens into the nasopharynx. So you have the nasal cavity in front and then you have your um, actual pharynx. And so we divide it into three parts. Um, usually the first two are always called nasopharynx and oropharynx. So they correspond to, is it behind the nose or behind the mouth? Um, and then the bottom most part, um, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, labeled as the hypopharynx. You can sometimes hear it called the laryngopharynx because um, it's the bit that connects to the larynx and also to the esophagus. Um, and so its job really is it needs to do two things. So it needs to pass food down to the epiglottis at the back and it needs to pass air down to the 
um, trachea at the front through the larynx. Um, and so obviously we have a little epiglottis there um, and its job is to make sure um, that you well, don't send food and drink down um, the front pipe through your larynx into your trachea. Um, now it's not alone in, actually we'll talk about Waldeyer's ring and then I'll talk about doing that. So um, Waldeyer's ring um, is a group of tonsils. Um, and so ton tonsils basically, they're just bunches of lymph nodes. So the lymphatic tissue, they've got lots of B and T cells um, and your tonsils in particular, they have an epithelium that allows them to trap pathogens and then create immune responses to them. Um, and so they're really good at, well, being your first line of defense basically. Um, and so they sit there over um, the entrance to the, the pharynx, basically, um, and they respond to infection. Now, obviously, you can get tonsillitis. Um, and that's usually in your palatine tonsils, which is why, you, you know, if you've heard of tonsils before, you've probably heard of the ones to either side, not the pharyngeal tonsil at the top or the lingual tonsil at the bottom. Um, and so those can obviously get inflamed and have to get taken out. Uh, but yeah, so the um, the epiglottis is not alone in this big project of trying to make sure you don't choke. Um, it also has help from um, your longitudinal muscle, muscles of the pharynx. Okay, so all of these guys, um, not, also not only the longitudinal, but also the circular muscles of the pharynx, they all help us swallow. Um, so this is part of your peristaltic, peristaltic process. Um, as you go, your, food, you know, your bolus of food goes from your mouth all the way down to your, um, well, through your digestive tract, basically. Um, and so at this first step, one of the big things that we do is we elevate the pharynx. So we lift it up, um, which is what happens when you swallow. If you, you know, try and actually swallow, um, you can feel it all moving up. Um, and a big part of what that does um, is it actually helps close off with the movement of the epiglottis, um, your, um, your nasal cavity and your... Um, larynx from the main passage which means the food can go down you know um straight into your esophagus without having risk of it going up into your nose which would be terrible um or into your um trachea which would be fatal potentially um and so these are all good eggs so the um i guess the ones i'd draw your attention to so remember that all of the longitudinal muscles they all basically go to the thyroid cartilage which is how they elevate this whole thing um uh the ones that are interesting so the stylopharyngeus we'll talk about briefly um when we talk about the larynx because it does a few things there um the salpingopharyngeus um is an interesting one because it actually comes from the auditory tube and so you'll notice sometimes that when you swallow um you you can help ear, you know pop your ears and that sort of thing um that's basically because it opens the auditory tube because it comes from the auditory tube. So when it constricts, it sort of um, forces it open um, and that can help equalize pressure through that whole system. Um, your circular muscles are very straightforward in that they all um, come from, so the superior comes from mandible, other ones come from basically the cartilage around there. Um, and they basically are the, they're almost like um, your circular or circumferential muscles in your bowel in that they basically do the same sort of um, peristalsis where you, you try to force the food down as you go. Um, yeah, and then in terms of innovation, pretty much all of them are vagus nerve. Um, there is one exception, which is the stylopharyngeus here, uh, which comes from our stylo process down um, and blends with our other ones. Um, that's innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, and let's talk about the larynx. So um, it has two functions, both of which are pretty important to us. So the it produces a modulate speed. So speech, so none of your rest of your body um, modulates the initial production of your voice. Um, obviously your mouth and your lips and everything um, you know, helps you form actual words and sounds and understandable speech. Um, but this is where it actually originates. Um, and so it sits basically, if you think of the thyroid cartilage, um, the thyroid itself doesn't sit um, anterior to the thyroid cartilage. It's just sort of inferior and anterior to the thyroid cartilage. So really, if anything, it's closer to the cricoid, um, cricoid cartilage. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about the anatomical um, relations here. So in terms of moving the larynx itself, we have a group called the extrinsic muscles of the larynx. I've already talked about most of them in um, the context of the, um, the big head and neck video. Um, so go and have a look at that if you'd like to look at the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles of the neck. Um, and there's also the video on um, organization of the neck by Lily, which goes into a little bit of detail there. Um, and then we have one lonely guy, the stylopharyngeus, which is part of our longitudinal muscles of the pharynx rather than the muscle of the neck. And that also um, helps elevate the um, the larynx. Okie dokie. So let's talk about the actual movements. And this is quite tricky. So 
feel free to take your time um, and really understand it um, because they may end up asking you what this does, how it works, what I, what's the actual function. Uh, and so I like to think of it as a bunch of um, mostly paired muscles um, in that they all sort of do, well, most of them at least, um, do something that a different muscle then does the opposite of. So um, our first set is going to be the cricothyroid versus the thyroid and vocalis. Um, so your cricothyroid over here, um, it tenses the vocal cords, so it makes them um, longer. Basically, your vocal cords, by the way, are these little white lines here. Um, and so it, you can imagine sort of pulling from the front, so pulling them forward, making them longer. Um, and that makes the, well, if you um, play a string instrument, you know that if you stretch it out, um, it's going to make it um, higher. Um, and so that raises the pitch of your voice and also raises the volume to a degree. Um, and another thing that it does is it tilts the thyroid forward because it's pull, if you think about it, it's pulling from the thyroid um, itself or the cricoid cartilage, which is attached to the thyroid, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so if you sing um, and then sing at increasingly high pitches, so start low, go high, um, you might be actually able to feel your thyroid sort of tilting forward and upwards um, because that cricothyroid is going to be working pretty hard because it's the main muscle um, responsible for doing that. Um, and then the thyroid and the vocalis, which is there's sort of a fuzzy distinction. Um, the, or if you hear about vocalis separately, it's, usually the medial sort of fibers here, um, they call it vocalis, um, but sometimes you just hear thyroid and they treat the vocalis as part of it. Um, and so you can think of them all, basically the important thing is that they um, relax the vocal cords, make them um, shorter. Um, and you have to have a balance between those two. Otherwise, um, if you get it too loose or get them too tight, um, then you don't actually um, produce sound. Um, so in terms of the uh, moving them in or out, making it wider or, or more closed, um, you have the posterior cricoarytenoid um, and the lateral cricoarytenoid. So the posterior cricoarytenoid, all of these work by rotating your little arytenoid cartilages, um, which are where the vocal cords are attached. Um, so your posterior um, it sort of rotates them outwards, which means that it opens the vocal cords. Um, and we call the space between the vocal cords the rima glottidis. Excuse me. Um, and then uh, that actually is the opening through which air can pass, obviously. Um, and so that um, opens that whole area, makes it bigger, um, and then actually uh, changes it up. I'm actually, we are actually not sure how it changes um, your voice. Uh, we think it might actually affect some unvoiced sounds. So make of that what you will. But we do know that the lateral cricoretinoids do the opposite. So they rotate it, them inwards and that closes um, the vocal cords. Note that it doesn't, it, it makes the rumiglottid is smaller, but it doesn't fully close it off. So you'll notice that there's sort of space at the back here. Um, and what actually closes that off is the um, transverse and oblique arytenoids. I don't know why they're called arytenoidus here. Um, but the point is basically um, they do properly close it off. And so that's your reflex when something does go down the wrong pipe. So your epiglottis has failed or some other muscles have failed or you just have weird anatomy. Um, these muscles say, oh no, something's going down. Slam it shut um, in an attempt to um, to stop food or water going down the trachea. Um, so they're pretty important. Um, the other thing I want you to note um, about the transverse arytenoids um, is that they actually do serve a, um, a function in um, in voice production, even though it sort of seems a little bit redundant, um, which is that if you think about it, um, a lot of the sounds that you create and a lot of the voicing that you do, you need a little bit of pressure to build up here. You can't, if you think of um, just starting to speak from nothing, um, your voice will start like very hoarse and, and quiet. Um, whereas if you think for a second, you can sort of feel a little pressure build up there and then it comes out and then you actually have what we're working, a working voice. Um, that's the side thing. The important thing, the actually relevant thing um, that I want you to remember um, is that the um, the posterior cricoarytenoid, out of all of these muscles, that's the only one that actually brings the vocal fold, uh, vocal cords, vocal folds, whatever you want to call them, apart. And that's going to be important. So hold on to that bit of information. All right. So last little bit of content. Um, which is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which supplies all of your intrinsic muscles, which is our, our previous ones that actually mess with the vocal cords, um, all of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, um, I should say, that should say, except um, for the cricothyroid. Um, I don't know why I forgot to write that, um, which is in, innovated by the superior lar laryngeal nerve. So that's um, supplied from the top, and the other ones are supplied from the bottom um, on the right and the left. Um, and so 
the you might remember that we screened for voice hoarseness in the respiratory um, history, and that's not only in case of just infection where you might have a sore throat and that might make you um, sort of hoarse because you're not using your voice so much or um, it feels painful to use your voice, um, but you actually get um, a hoarseness of the voice without pain or inflammation of the larynx itself if you have something like a pancos tumor so that's a tumor of the apex of the lung the very top it comes up and compresses that re recurrent laryngeal nerve and um, then you get paralysis of the um of the intrinsic muscle and so pancos tumor will only be happening on one side and so you get voice hoarseness if you get bilateral um, paralysis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve through whatever reason, um, then it's going to be really bad. So you um, end up getting voice, like even more extreme. So voice hoarseness is your normal version. You will get dyspnea and strider. Um, so think about for a second why that might be the case um, and hold on to that while we talk about this little diagram over here. So um, actually, the other thing I'd say is that um, the other common way to damage um, your recurrent laryngeal nerve is that when you have to have a thyroidectomy because your thyroid is acting up, um, so think Graves or Hashimoto's or something, um, or just a goiter, um, then you will need to take the inferior thyroid artery because that's part of the supply. You need to uh, take it or ligate it or whatever. Um, and while you're cutting that out, it can be sometimes pretty easy to sort of clip the recurrent limit of your nerve. And so thyroid surgeons have to be very um, careful about that. Um, so this photo over here, um, hopefully you can see my mouse, otherwise it's going to be super confusing. Um, but have a look here. This is what you'll actually see of a larynx. So you're not going to see the view on the right. Um, you might see a very weird version of it um, if you um, are on ENT surgery at some point. Um, but in practice, what you'll really see is this guy over here. So this is um, the view that you'll see during any gastroscopy or, or anything that goes, well, not a gastroscopy, a bronchoscopy that goes down into the lungs, um, or if you see um, ever through an anesthetic scope um, because they're trying to put the tube down. Um, and so this is the actual view you see without having to cut anything away. Um, and so if you look at it, you can sort of see all of the anatomy falling into place. So your actual vocal cords here, they're quite distinctive. So that's your inner cords here. You've got your rheum glottidus, which is currently in the shape of a bit of a triangle. Um, you have your false vocal cords, um, which is your vestibular ligaments, and they're to either side, they're quite fat or, or larger. Um, over the front here, this big thing here is almost like a tongue. Um, it's not the tongue, it's your epiglottis. Um, and that's that big space here. Um, the back wall and the whole wall area around here is going to be formed by the thyroid cartilage. These guys, these lines here are the cuneiform cartilage and these little bumps here are the cuneiform tubercles. Um, and then it, if you ask to, to label the muscles, you, you'll be able to um, refer to the anatomy there and think about, okay, what connects at which region, um, what's going to affect these bits here, the vocal cords, what's going to affect um, the rheumaglottis, all of that sort of stuff. And you can see the sort of ridged appearance of the trachea down there with all that cartilage. Okay, so coming back to the question I asked before, um, why are you going to get dyspnea and strider um, if you get bilateral um, paralysis of the um, recurrent laryngeal nerve? And it's because it supplies our friends the posterior cricorytenoids. Um, and so if you remember, these guys are the only guys that open this space. And so if you don't have these guys working, um, everything else is, well, everything is paralyzed except for your cricothyroid. Um, the resting position of the vocal cords is going to actually be pretty close to closed. Um, and that means that ear only has a small space to go in and out. So it's going to be harder to breathe. And specifically, we get strider, which is the sign that we get really um, when there's a restriction um, in the, this, you know, something obstructing the, um, the um, airway, basically, um, or something. Um, impinging on it and making it very small um, as opposed to hoarseness and well, hoarseness is the the vocal muscles and then a wheeze is something deeper down um, so yeah that's a, a good way to uh, think about your differentials for um, what stridor might mean on your respiratory exam perfect okay so i've got a couple diagrams here because i think it's hard to understand a lot of this stuff um, in terms of where it was i know it took me ages um, and so hopefully this might help you think about where things are and actually be able to identify them um, in a diagram and there's a little bit over here um, on what the muscles do perfect hope that was helpful and um, see you next week